Hello, I'm Mike Henriksen from O'Reilly Media, and today I'm going to be talking with Mike Lukides, my fellow VP of Content Strategy at O'Reilly Media, and we're going to be talking for our Code podcast series. Today's conversation is going to center around mostly functional languages and then a couple other languages. Mike, how are you doing? How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So I've got a graphic here that I want to show, and I'm just going to put it right in here for a second, right over me. And this is basically showing the growth of functional languages. And you and I have discussed this a little bit, but it's showing a, a pretty nice growth from 2004 to 2011. But I think the scale is what's important. It went from basically 500 units to close to 25,000. So it's still relatively small as a group. And the one thing on the bottom that shows that's what's really driving this is um, R. R looks like about half of all the units for functional languages. So what do you think of R as a functional language and um, its growth? Yeah, I don't know that I'd really consider R a functional language. Um, I know there's some debate about that, but R has certainly had huge growth because of the interest in data science. I mean, it, it's a very odd language to work with if you're familiar with programming languages, but it's really well designed for people doing statistics and anything and, and anything related to data. So it's a deal tool for that and uh, you know the data science movement certainly has driven R into into a lot of places where it just wasn't being used two or three years ago. Yeah. You know one other thing that this chart kind of brings up and I'm gonna go ahead and remove it now is the, the fact that there are quite a few languages here that have actually come from nothing to something. So it's implying to me that we're having more people using a broader set of programming tools. Is that what you see functional doing for programming? I think that's definitely true. I mean, one of the things that goes back to uh, Dave... Uh, yeah, Andy Hunt and uh, Dave Thomas is pragmatic programmer is the notion of, you know, learning a, uh, learning a new programming language every year, and particularly learning programming languages that taught you new concepts. And that's driven a lot of people to learning functional languages because they behave in different ways than the languages that most of us grew up with, which are typically procedural languages like you know C or one of its one of the things that's derived from C. So so, yeah, uh, the whole polyglot programming movement has created a lot of interest in this new set of programming tools. So, of all the languages that were up there, other than R, which one do you think would possibly take off a little bit more? And I'll put this back up so you can, so that people can see that again. Um, do you think it's Scala? Do you think it's Clojure, F Sharp, uh, Scheme? I don't think it's scheme, although I'm. It's it's very interesting looking in the right hand corner of the chart and seeing that scheme has the most consistent upward curve. Um, F sharp, I think, is going to have a huge influence in the Microsoft space. Probably not a whole lot outside of Microsoft. Microsoft um, in the open source communities, I think Clojure and Scala will. Uh, will probably end up being roughly on a par with each other. Scala is clearly a little bit ahead now, but I think Clojure will catch up. Uh, Clojure is very Lisp-like and closer to being a pure object-oriented language, although I'm probably using uh, using a definition of pure that a lot of people wouldn't like. Uh, uh, Scala looks a little bit more like, uh, and people will be mad at me for saying this too, but I think Scala looks a little bit more like, uh, you know, like Java from which it was derived. You know, a better Java is what some people have called it. But I think those, I think those will be dominant. Erlang is a language that has been around for a long time since the early lady, early eighties, maybe even the late seventies. Uh, it's was designed for use in highly reliable concurrent systems, and uh, I think even 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 though it looks like it's trending downward in this graph, I believe that uh, you'll probably see a lot. You'll probably see a lot more Erlang over the last few years too. 
Yeah, one thing for us to remember and for everyone who looks at this data, this is book sales. This is not necessarily popularity of a language or usage of a language or you know how many companies have licenses or use it in their products or anything like that. This is book sales. So we should take all this with a little grain of salt here. Um, and this is what's done well in the last few years in retail book sales. Um, so do you think that most developers out there who are using functional languages understand the benefits of maybe, you know, uh, productivity increases once they've learned it, it's very easy and the power of expressiveness, uh, reliability functions may be easier to reason about and test than stateful objects, uh, concurrency that, you know, there's a lot of natural um, concurrency with the functional languages and then also um, you know modularity and composability that they're they're somewhat easy to plug in uh, together more easily than complex OS systems do you think those benefits most programmers know about that's a good question I mean I think a lot of what's driving the interest in functional languages is a search for a magic bullet that makes it easier for programmers to solve problems of concurrency. Increasingly, you know, as we've gotten to the end of, you know, you know, CPU speeds have been stuck at roughly the same level for the past four or five years. And what Moore's law has given us has not been faster CPUs, but more uh, more transistors on a chip and hence more C more CPUs on a chip, more cores to work with. And using that effectively is the single biggest problem facing computer scientists today. Um, there are some things about functional languages that make, uh, that make concurrency easier to deal with. Uh, the fact that the fact that you can't have state variables may make programmers make programs that are easy to debug and certainly it makes leads to programs that are more reliable uh, more reliable in a in, in a concurrent situation uh, but yeah, actually I, to be honest if the question is as simple as do programmers understand all the advantages of functional languages I'm not sure that they do uh, and I think they'll I think they'll I think they'll find it out uh, and I also to some extent I also think that we're still looking for a new language that is going to that, you know that's going to that's going to make programming in the 21st century a lot easier than it is now and well, such some, a language may may not even exist that's an interesting question yeah some of the the language features that have been uh recently being added into java and say javascript seem like they're inspired by some of the functional languages and yet people may not actually realize that but does this help explain why, why there's such a growth in JavaScript? And also, there is a nice resurgence in Java as well. If, if you look at, again, this is book sales about these languages, but both JavaScript and Java have grown really well. And some of the language features that may have come from the functional languages seem to be sneaking in the back door. Well, I think in the case of JavaScript, the features were there from the beginning. Uh, it's just that people didn't know a, people didn't know about them or didn't know how to use them until until Crockford's JavaScript the good parts. I mean, you have to remember that JavaScript sort of began its history as this sort of low-level glue for web pages, and lots of JavaScript developers really never learned how to use it for more than that. And then, how long ago? Five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, when when Gmail came out and then Google Maps, people all of a sudden said, "Wow, Google is writing these entire applications in Java, and they're running in the browser. Uh, how can we do that?" Um, a year or two after that, you know, JavaScript, the good parts came out, and that's been part of a whole revolution in how JavaScript is used. I mean, the language, I wouldn't even say that the language has grown up because those features have been in there, been there for a long time, but the 
way the language is used has grown tremendously. Uh, the fact that people are now using it as a server-side language with Node, which is a very nice, uh, you know, you know, a very nice framework for uh, uh, for do, for doing high-performance uh, websites. Uh, other things like D3 for doing really, uh, really exotic and beautiful interactive data visualization. Uh, JavaScript has just matured in a in a really wonderful way. Um, yeah, speaking of the maturity JavaScript. of JavaScript, we have uh, our Fluence, Fluent conference coming up in yes. May 29th through the 31st in San Francisco. And I just noticed there was a really interesting talk, and it's kind of hitting right on the head what we've been talking about here. The title of the talk is called Functional Programming with Streams in Node.js by Adam Crabtree. And that sounds like, it, again... Functional languages have found their way into other languages, including JavaScript, um, and that should be quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, somebody the other day said that JavaScript isn't really a functional programming language, but it's designed so loosely and so flexibly that it's very easy to use it as a functional programming language. And in fact, I don't remember who wrote this, but I was reading an interesting blog this morning or yesterday morning uh, about using C++ as a functional language. Hmm. Uh, and, and of course we have, uh, uh, now I'm blanking on the title, our own book that by Dean Wampler, uh, Functional Programming in Java or Java, uh, yeah, Functional Programming in Java. And Java is really not intended as a, as, as a functional language. And, and this book doesn't take advantage of any of the new features that are going to be in Java 8 but aren't there yet. Uh, but a number of the core things that are central to functional languages are things that you can do in almost any programming language. It's just a matter of, of acquiring a particular discipline in how you use the language. And if you do that, you will make your code, uh, you will make your code a lot more robust um, and, and much easier to, to debug. So, yeah. Uh, the ideas from functional programming can be taken almost anywhere. Yes, yeah, so functional programming and other languages may be um, on the rise as well, which I don't think I can tease out in the data as well as finding out, you know, you know, how many of those Java books have a chapter on functional programming or how many books on JavaScript have, you know, you know, a chapter on streams you know, and, and that sort of thing. So it may be larger than we think, but uh, functional seems to be growing at a nice rate, and we'll see how it does again next year. So, Mike, thank you for your time, and maybe our next talk we'll talk about one of your favorite topics, the uh, NoSQL databases and web databases. Okay. Well, thanks. I've, I've enjoyed this, so uh, looking forward to it. Great. Thank you.